गुड इवनिंग गाइस डॉक्टर मुकुल है योर ऑर्थोपेडिक इंस्ट्रक्टर एट अन अकेडमी सो प्लीज जस्ट गिव मी अ थम्स अप टू लेट मी नो दैट द ऑडियो विजुअल इज वर्किंग वेल विच मीन्स यू कैन सी मी यू कैन हेयर मी यू कैन सी माई पॉइंटर हेयर ऑन दी बोर्ड ओके वेल परफेक्ट नाउ आई थिंक द ऑडियो विजुअल इज ऑल ओके सो यू कैन सी मी यू कैन हेयर मी सो कैन हैव दैट थम्स अप गाय सो दैट आई नो दैट यू गाइज आर ऑल कंफर्टेबल सो दैट आई कैन जस्ट बिगिन दिस सेशन दैट इज टारगेटिंग द अपकमिंग आई एन आई सी टी पेपर uh perhaps you know you are very much familiar with this fact that an academy has planned up a premier league to quickly rush you through all the important areas uh especially you know the high yield topics before you sit in the exam and perhaps you know my part here will be to wrap up orthopedics so there are two sessions you know we've planned for you for orthopedics session 1 is today and session 1 and uh, 2 will be tomorrow and each session is one hour duration and i'm going to cover up 10 topics each today and tomorrow so 20 important topics will be covered up expecting that at least you know uh 5 to 8 questions will be from this zone out of you know 8 to 10 questions we have in orthopedics so you guys are all in your thumb is up so i think i can quickly start the discussion starting first up with the basic orthopedic part little bit of orthopedic history because often you know a question pops up from the orthopedic history side also in your exam any idea who's called the father of orthopedics good evening shitesh so please please try your hands on this one who who is called the father of orthopedics any guesses on that any guesses yes guys so so can i ask you guys to guess this one any idea who's called as the father of orthopedics Yes. <coughs> okay. Well, very nice, Divya. Your your guess is absolutely right. It's Nicholas Henry, who is called the father of orthopedics, because this is the gentleman who actually coined this word, orthopedics. See, the word ortho basically means straight. The word physics basically means child, as you know. so this is basically a branch that started to correct the deformities in children and it 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 was coined by nicholas henry this word orthopedics so because he gave birth to this branch is called as the father of orthopedics but there are some other important people also who get some kind of a credit and some respect in orthopedics like this gentleman lawrence bowler he is the gentleman who supposed to coin who have coined this word traumatology now this word trauma basically means wound so study of wounds and perhaps you know this is now a term that's extrapolated to study of all the fractures so this word was coined by lawrence bowler so he is called the father of traumatology clear enough anyone who can help me out with with dr robert jones Uh, anyone who can help me out with Dr. Robert Jones? Any idea what was his contribution, Dr. Robert Jones? Yes, Shitesh, Navni, Devya, Prince. Ah, uh, anyone who can let me know a little bit about Dr. Robert Jones? Any contribution know about this gentleman? Well, well, well. Let me tell you, he was no way a small person. He is called the father of modern orthopedics. and perhaps is called the father of this modern orthopedics because he is the gentleman who introduced to us x rays so all those x rays i'm going to show you in orthopedics these classes they were introduced to orthopedics by this gentleman dr robert jones and his uncle dr h o thomas this great man gave us the cervical collars that you use in cervical spine injury he gave us a thomas splint that we used to immobilize lower limb fractures he also gave us something called a thomas test 
Thomas test is a method to find a flexion deformity at the hip. Sometimes the hip joint is fixed in flexion and spine is masking that deformity. So to take away that contribution of spine and to find that FFD at the hip, we use this Thomas test. So this gentleman for his great innovations, he is called the father of British orthopedics. So just a little bit of quick recap of all the important orthopedic history for you guys. So please do remember these names because on a bad day, they can simply be MCQs in your exams. Then you lose a point over nothing. Clear. So which is the commonest fractured carpal bone? Hamate, triquitrum, lunate or scaphoid? Yes. So are you guys clear with this concept or this bit of confusion here? So perhaps I think you guys are pretty much familiar with this. That there are eight carpal bones. She looks too pretty try to catch her uh, you are familiar with that formula so can you guys help me out which is the commonest fractured carpal bone fairly good enough fairly good enough scaphoid yes i'll give it to you yes you are absolutely correct with the answer but i'll take this opportunity to discuss a little with you this fracture of the scaphoid this is undoubtedly the commonest carpal bone fracture but uh, if you are going to ask me about the age group here, the adolescents, and they generally come to you with that history fall on outstretched hand. So that is how you know the adolescents are generally going to get this fracture, fall on outstretched hand. Okay, and in adolescent, if you are an adolescent, you have a fall on outstretched hand, you are generally going to fracture your scaphoid in the wrist. Now, in case there is a scaphoid fracture, this bone scaphoid has a distal pole, a proximal pole. Now, right in the center, there is an area called waist. So, what you find with the fractures, that the fractures mostly involve this waist area. So a scaphoid fracture would by and large be a fracture through this particular area. That's the waist. Now, in case there'll be a scaphoid fracture, the diagnostic hallmark for this fracture is generally taken to be tenderness that involves the anatomical snuff box. So you have tenderness in that snuff box. That means you are dealing with a fracture of scaphoid. This is more diagnostic even than an X-ray. Because most fractures we take X-ray as diagnostic. This is more diagnostic even than an X-ray. Please be clear about it. Okay. Now, in case there is tenderness in the snuff box and there is a fracture of scaphoid, you all know the treatment very well for this fracture. You give a cast in a very classical position that's called a glass holding position. So you will apply a glass holding cast to stabilize this fracture. So that's how you want to treat this fracture. But this is particularly a fracture that is uh, more famous not for treatment but for the complications that are associated with this fracture. So guys, this is the distal radius. Now, in front of radius, this is where you have this bone scaphoid and this is where you have that bone lunate. Now, as I pointed to you, scaphoid would have a distal pole, it would have a proximal pole and in the center, this particular area will be called as the waist. Now, the radial artery travels like this near the distal radius where you feel the pulse. You have the radial artery going over here. Now, radial artery classically gives a branch that enters through the distal pole, crosses the waist to supply the proximal pole. So, that is the blood supply pattern in this scaphoid. Now, you can very well imagine that if there will be a fracture involving this waist zone, this blood supply to this proximal pole is going to be cut off. So, I don't think this requires any kind of an introduction. The first complication we get over here is avascular necrosis that is going to involve the proximal pole. Clear with that? So this is the first complication that you find over here. 
Now, wherever AVN is one complication, by default, the other complication would always be non-union. Because AVN and non-union are brothers and sisters, they are always found together. AVN means there is a problem in the blood supply and problem in the blood supply means union will be a challenge. A little more common out of the two tends to be non-union. Although both of them are fairly common complications. And just in case non-union happens in the scaphoid, a hump would form on back of the wrist. So non-union of the scaphoid is known to generate what we orthopedic surgeons call as the hump back deformity. So are you guys clear with all these points? So clear with all important things about a fracture of scaphoid? Clear with it? 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 Yes, please, please let me know. All comfortable till here? Perfect enough, perfect enough, perfect enough. So let the questions get a little difficult now because they were pretty warm up type of questions. But let the question get a little difficult now. One more topic, one more topic to cover. Little bit about wrist dislocations. Wrist dislocations. So the topic here is the dislocation of this bone unit. So you have to tell me, please mind you, the incorrect statement regarding dislocation of unit. The dislocated unit would give a spilled coffee appearance. Dislocation you more correctly see on a lateral view. Median nerve involvement can occur post this dislocation. And lunate would usually go and dislocate posteriorly when there is a lunate dislocation. Yes. So Navnita says B, but Shubham says no D. So the queries have already started coming up as the questions have started going difficult. So I am talking more of the upper limb injuries right now, the hand and wrist injuries because they have been pretty much popular with the examiners of late. Perhaps a little bit about the scaphoid fracture and now a little bit about the dislocation at the wrist. All right, Shitish says C. So you guys are spanned across all options. So in a way, I've got the message that that perhaps there is some problem, and you guys are not clear with this topic, wrist dislocation. So maybe I'll just clear it to you. I'll just clear it to you. See, there are two category of dislocations you may have at the wrist. One is lunate dislocation, and the second category is called a perilunate dislocation. Now guys, in lunate dislocation, you will simply find that it is lunate that dislocates out of the carpus, fine. But in perilunate dislocation, what you will find? Other bones dislocate out of carpus. So please mind you, please mind you. Other bones means bones except this bone unit. So all other carpal bones will dislocate but not lunate. I'll show you the two dislocation categories also if you don't believe me. See, this is the normal scenario. Now when you look at a lateral view where these dislocations are very prominent and very clear. So what are you going to find? You will be able to trace this radius in front of it lunate, then capitate and other carpal bones you can say. So everything will be in one line normally. Now you are supposed to first check the distal radius. You cannot find lunate with the radius. It is lunate dislocation. You check this distal radius. You are able to see the lunate with it. You cannot see other carpal bones in line. It is perilunate dislocation because lunate is with the radius. Clear. I will just try to show you the two images. See, this is the distal radius here, this shadow, and I hope you can see this half moon shaped bone lunate with it. So, lunate is with the radius, but not other carpal bones. So, I am calling it a perilunate dislocation. Fairly clear. But if you see this other image, I will just trace this distal radius for you. And I have marked this bone lunate for you, this half moon shaped bone. So lunate is not with the radius, although other carpal bones are, but lunate is out, I am calling it lunate dislocation. So are you guys clear with the two category of dislocations? Are you guys clear with the two category of dislocations? And you will be able to pick them up from the x-rays. 
especially the perilunar dislocation because little more common out of the two tends to be the perilunar dislocation now if you are clear with this picture solving this question will be very easy dislocated lunate gives a spilled coffee appearance yes see here look at this lunate you can very well see it's looking like a teapot as if you know someone can pour some tea into a cup and drink so dislocated lunate is very well giving you that spilled coffee or spilled tea sign dislocation you can pick up in the lateral view very easily and you can even decide whether it is a lunate or perilunate dislocation median nerve involvement can occur yes because you can very well see lunate is going anteriorly and in front of the wrist you will have the median nerve so that makes it logical that median nerve involvement would generally be the nerve involvement if in this case if at all it happens and lunate dislocates possibly no it dislocates anteriorly so clear with this guys and mind you mind you lunate is called lunate because it is this half moon shaped bone on a lateral view if you see lunate on a on a ap view you will find the bone to be rectangular not moon shaped at all so that is why it is the lateral view that classically shows the lunate not the ap view in fact lunate is called lunate because of its appearance on the lateral view so that's why dislocations we generally search for by looking at the lateral views so are you guys clear with all these points clear with all these points so can i have that thumbs up you guys are comfortable with me till here yes shitish shubham namnita prince uh, i hope you guys are all comfortable with everything till here clear with this fair enough okay perfect enough perfect enough perfect enough perfect enough so so any queries still here any queries still here or anything not clear to you? you want me to explain something again okay fair enough so so thanks for giving me the thumbs up i think things are clear enough to you now this is again been a little bit of a troublesome type of a question uh pull of which muscle makes it difficult to maintain a reduction when you are treating a case of bennett's fracture okay so 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 that's another troublesome question you know that's been a part of the uh mcq exams that you guys have faced over past few years and perhaps you know a lot of questions come on bennett fracture or it's twin 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 rolando fracture so i will take this opportunity to settle all the doubts all together okay so divya says adductor pollicis uh, please says adductor pollicis please guys know it's actually adductor pollicis longus not adductor pollicis i know you know adductor is attached on the uh, first metacarpal where you have the bennett fracture but even abductor is attached over there and it's abductor now please first of all let me brief to you as to what is a bennett fracture and what is its cousin rolando fracture now when i'm talking of these fractures which is the area i'm talking of i'm talking about the intra articular fractures that will be involving the base of the first metacarpal now please this first metacarpal would mean the metacarpal of the thumb so i am right now speaking about this thumb metacarpal and i'm talking of this base of the thumb metacarpal and mind you here you would have the carpal bone trapezium okay so basically these are fractures involving this trapezio metacarpal joint so they are fractures involving the trapezio metacarpal joint in the thumb clear now both of them are involving the trapezio metacarpal joint but what is the essential difference if you find an oblique shaped fracture in this area that's what we call as bennett and if you find a y shaped fracture in that area that's we call as roland like see a y is being formed over here so that's rolando but see this oblique shape bennett now please the problem with an oblique shape 
that an oblique thing can slip can slide so part and parcel of a bennett's fracture tends to be this problem displacement so displacements are generally seen with the bennett's fracture because of the oblique pattern and when you talk of a displacement in bennett's fracture this is generally the culprit abductor pollicis longus so are you guys clear with these two fractures because they can be very overlapping very confusing very much in the same area the trapezium metacarpal joint but then it is the shape of the fracture that makes it displaced yes rolando generally tends to be undisplaced absolutely right because it's little comminuted it is a broken to multiple areas and you know this y type of a pattern or and you know this comminution is seen in rolando but bennett being oblique very easily slips especially because of the pull of this muscle abductor pollicis longus clear enough with that so clear enough clear enough guys clear enough clear clear enough fair enough so that was a little bit about the hand and wrist injuries scaphoid fracture wrist dislocations okay um now it's time for me to take up a little bit about the spinal injuries also because again this is very 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 confusing area uh no not uncommon for you to see is a head on collision between two vehicles happen so common uh happen so common you know a head on collision and a rear end collision i think you are pretty much familiar with these injuries see sometimes both the drivers are on mobile phone no one is watching in front and that's where you have this head on collision but sometimes one driver is very diligent he stopped very nicely at the red light he saw the red light but the person behind was on the mobile phone he did not see the red light bang rear end collision so these are you know two common pattern of injuries so suppose someone lands up with head on collision so what do you think will be the mode of injury leading to fractures in this case well, very nice guys absolutely right you're all spot on it will be flexion distraction perfect full enough but can you tell me which fracture are you going to see in this scenario uh, can you name that fracture that would generally find if a patient lands up with this head on collision yes so can you name out that fracture yes shitesh devya shubham you are all right and what you generally seen head on collision is a flexion distraction injury pattern but can you give me the name of that fracture yes anyone 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 who can provide me with the name of that fracture no problem i'll help you out with that uh, no not for ibral tear no 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 we call it a chance fracture no whiplash no whiplash please adna no 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 whiplash chance fracture so please 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 i'll 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 take this call to explain both these things to you in a better way see chance fracture is not that by chance please it's gq chance named after the person who described this fracture So this is that fracture that you see in head-on collision, and that results from this injury pattern, a flexion distraction injury. Now this injury pattern is also popular by this name, jack knife injury. So what you would find that the fracture line will be transecting the vertebra from front to back like this. this anterior part of the vertebra would be collapsing in flexion but these posterior sides will be opening up with the force of distraction so this is a jack knife that opens posteriorly to become straight so you can see the front part collapsing the rear part distracting because the fracture line has traversed the vertebra from front to back so this is what you see in head on collisions that flexion distraction jack knife injury pattern and this is what gives rise to these chance fractures they are very dangerous fractures almost every time you find uh, people landing up with paralysis and it's generally the dorso lumbar junctional area that's mostly involved with this injury pattern so d12 l1 area 
is where you mostly find these fractures of jackknife injury pattern. Now, a lot of you were talking of whiplash injury here, please. That's absolutely a different pattern. Because this is an injury pattern that you rather see in rear end collisions. Okay. So you are sitting in the car and someone hits you from the back. So your car will be moving but because of inertia you will be falling back. Am I right? So what is going to happen at your neck will be hyper extension. And once the car stops, this will be followed by that hyperflexion. Because first you are going to be thrown back. Then as the car will come to a halt, you are going to be thrown in front. So it is an extension followed by flexion. Hyper extension. This is the injury factor, not hyperflexion. So injury in whiplash basically occurs from hyperextension MCQ, 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 another MCQ. Clear? So are you guys now clear? Uh, what you find in head-on collisions? Chance fracture. What you find in rear-end collisions? The whiplash injury pattern. Clear with that? And anyone who can tell you the vertebral fracture that happens in whiplash, which vertebra generally fractures when there is hyperextension injury at the neck? Yes. Shubham. Uh, Adnan, Navnita, uh, Shitesh, Divya, Davis, anyone who can help me out with this one, which vertebra generally fractures when there is a whiplash injury, like chance fracture you have to round the dorsal lumbar junction, but which vertebra would generally fracture when there is a whiplash injury, any guesses guys, any guesses, any wild guesses, any guesses, thoracolumbar, googly, it was a small goalie, no fractures. Please. Whiplash is most of the times just muscle strains in neck. So please don't get carried away by the name. It is only the name that is dangerous. By and large. A very, very, very safe injury factor. So hyperextension is a very less damaging injury factor. This flexion distraction is a dangerous injury mechanism. Please be clear about it. So I hope you are a little bit clear about these mobile factor injuries also in a very effective way. Okay. And I hope you are clear. This is what is dangerous. Head-on collisions. This is relatively much safer. Rear-end collisions. And you are clear what you are going to get in head-on collision and you are clear what you are going to get in a rear-end collision. I hope you are clear with both these injury patterns. You will be able to pick them up from the x-rays also. And please, 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 whiplash, safe injury, uh, only muscle strains, no real fractures. Okay? Alright. Which is not a muscle of rotator cuff. Fairly easy one. So, which is not a muscle of rotator cuff. I know you are pretty much familiar with the anatomy part. And actually, this is more or less a question from anatomy. My orthopedic question will follow up the anatomy question. So I thought, why not first have a quick recap of anatomy. So please help me out with this one. Not a muscle of rotator cuff. Neha says B. Namnita says B. But Shubham says D. So, so there's a bit of fight between you guys. No, So I won't uh, let you fight much. It's actually teres major that is the answer it is not teres major it is teres minor that is actually a muscle of rotator cuff so here it is written teres major so it was a close call so that's what becomes the answer see rotator cuff a group of four muscles going right in the front of scapula attaching to the lesser tuberosity this muscle is subscapularis going right on the top Attaching to this greater tuberosity of the humerus. This muscle is supraspinatus. Okay. Now when you look at the back, you find two muscles going and attaching to the back of the greater tuberosity. The upper muscle, that's infraspinatus. 
and this lower muscle is teres minor not major clear okay. so i hope you are clear with these four muscles now you can see this word cuff so why cuff because these muscles are surrounding the shoulder like a cuff there is a muscle in the front subscap there is a muscle at the top supra there is a muscle at back infraintibes so they are surrounding the shoulder from front to back so that's why that word cuff and why the word rotator now you can very well imagine that if this muscle subscapulus in the front will contract is going to pull the shoulder into a position of internal rotation common sense and you can very well imagine that if these muscles at the back are going to contract they are rather going to pull this numerous into a position of external rotation so you can very well see that these are the muscles rotating the shoulder internally and externally so the word rotator cuff so clear with that anatomy part clear okay so it's navneet sorry for that sorry for that spelling mistake navneet but but it's very good to see you participating and awake even at the dead end of the night sometimes you have to you know deliberately misspell a few people to keep the class going and you know because sometimes classes at dead end of the night can be really really um, you know uh, having a sleeping effect on you so that's that's amazing to see you guys all uh, up with your arms and uh, you know interacting that's amazing that that's the best thing for a teacher so guys the muscles that make up this rotator cuff see subscapularis this is the muscle that is responsible for internal rotation of the shoulder and infra anteriors these are the muscles that are responsible for external rotation of the shoulder the muscle supraspinatus is a muscle that generally leads to first 15 degrees of abduction at the shoulder so that initiation of the shoulder abduction is what you get from supraspinatus now all these muscles would have a tendency to tear and i would just like to share with you guys the clinical tests with which you can pick up tears of these muscles now for subscapularis lift off test and belly press test are the popular clinical tests for evaluation for supraspinatus you have to know about the empty can sign and some people also call it as job's empty can sign and for these external rotators you guys should be familiar with horn row sign so all these muscles uh you know they can have tears and you are supposed to know the names of these clinical tests for picking up tears of each of these muscles out of them all the most common muscle to tear in the cuff tends to be supraspinatus and this muscle subscapularis is often called the forgotten muscle of the rotator cuff mcq and mcq from the previous aims exam and it's called a forgotten muscle because you know its lesions are generally hidden on mris and clinical examinations and you generally tend to overlook these images uh, these these tears they are generally missed so clear with these points now in case you are clear with these tests and you are able to pick up a rotator cuff tear the treatment for a rotator cuff tear is going to be an arthroscopic repair so you have to put a camera in the shoulder and you know under direct visualization you are supposed to repair these tears so arthroscopic repair is what you will proceed with in case you will find any of these rotator cuff muscles stop now a previous inicity paper gave you this terrible question 80 years old male has come to you with a massive retracted chronic irreparable rotator cuff tear and you were supposed to choose the best line of management for this case so in case someone comes to you with an old tear here the muscle is all degenerated no more rotator cuff is left and it's 80 years of age what will be the treatment option you want to choose from this shubham says a uh, shoulder arthroplasty neha says leave it conservative because it's 80 years old you know who is going to 
see this man okay come on man you cannot neglect old people they also have a life you have to you know um, give respect to them these old people took care of you when you were too young and you needed their help so no way can they be left conservative with this problem okay a or b so answer is actually d here reverse shoulder arthroplasty but yes i would like to explain to you what is reverse shoulder arthroplasty so reverse shoulder means you put the humerus head on the glenoid and you put this glenoid on the humerus reverse the articulation so reverse shoulder arthroplasty see a shoulder arthroplasty will be done when there is osteoarthritis at the shoulder and at least you know the muscles have to be intact otherwise what will move the shoulder if the muscles will not be there what is the point of replacing a joint when you cannot move a joint so muscles around the shoulder have to be intact otherwise it will just just look it so this is an indication to do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty rather so let me explain what is reverse shoulder arthroplasty in a very nice way with a very nice diagram so that is the scapula and that is the humerus and say this is the center of rotation of a normal shoulder normal this is the normal center of rotation now in reverse shoulder arthroplasty i am going to change the articulations i am going to cut this glenoid and attach a humerus head here i am going to cut this humerus and i am going to attach a glenoid cavity here so when i reverse these articulations this is the new center of rotation of this new shoulder now so i hope you can very well pick up the center of rotation has been moved down and out it's been moved a little out and down now you have a muscle going on top of the shoulder like this this is that muscle that you call as deltoid now when you move the center of rotation down this deltoid is stretched now a muscle that is stretched becomes more powerful and as the deltoid becomes more powerful this first 15 degrees of abduction can also be now taken care by deltoid and rest of the abduction is already taken care by deltoid so basically what is reverse shoulder arthroplasty doing allowing deltoid to function as that muscle supraspinatus making it more powerful allowing deltoid only to initiate abduction so are you guys clear with that the only problem that to do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty the age has to be over and above 70 years in case the age is under 70 years we go with tendon transfers we use some spare tendon to reconstruct supraspinatus tendon because the supraspinatus itself is irreparable so young people are candidates for tendon transfers old people are candidates for reverse shoulder arthroplasty in irreparable rotator cuff tears so are you guys clear with this topic also clear with this rotator cuff part so can i have that thumbs up because i you know this is a little difficult area to grasp but you have warmed up so well i'm sure this concept will also be clear to you guys so clear with that navneet shitesh ali neha shubham raj clear with this fatma 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 no easy one and easy one and easy one after that difficult one so this is an amputation show number here quickly tell me which is this amputation i'm sure this will be very easy for you to answer so this is an amputation that gives you a very good functional outcome so this is a national stamp of bangladesh this is a blind person they have shown so they have shown that this is an amputation that is specifically preferred in the blind people so quickly tell me which amputation is shown in this in this image lot of images questions you will have in your exams now inct paper full of images full of images so that is the whole idea of showing you these images excellent excellent wonderful atnan so you are absolutely right and and ali you are absolutely right this is a krukenberg amputation so that is what a krukenberg amputation is you make a fork with these four arm bones like this and this is a functional fork and since it's a functional fork 
this is an amputation that is specifically preferred in the blind people because you know in blind people you have to give the maximum function so that is what you know these researchers are trying to show that even they rehabilitated their blind people by giving them those amputations that are functional that is the whole idea but i could see some other terms also like chopart pirogov signs in there so from this image can you pick up which is this amputation this is certainly not crooked bug now you know but is it chopart pirogov or signs yes okay chopart chopart yes absolutely right see if you go through the tarsal bones that's where we talk of the chopart amputation if you are going through this tarso metatarsal joint because these are all tarsal bones talus calcaneum these will be those cuneiforms navicula this is through the tarsal chopart if you are going through this tarso metatarsal joint this is where you call the amputation to be less frank and when you are going through the ankle this is where you use the word signs clear with that so are you guys clear the answer here is going to be chopart amputation clear with that any confusion any confusion any confusion no confusion shitish any confusion not need any confusion not need you are awake i know you could pick up my mistakes so any confusion are not any confusion because you've been answering so well neha ali any confusions okay no confusions so guys should we use the word amputation for signs or should we call it sorry disarticulation see as far as i know if you are going through a joint the better word to use is disarticulation so i am saying sign this through the ankle joint so shouldn't it be called disarticulation and not amputation so which is the better word for sign amputation or disarticulation that's what my question is yes neha ali shatish namni the wall been this nigat man so 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 raj what will be the better word uh, so shines we called a disarticulation or should it actually be called an amputation because generally to joints we use the word disarticulation knee disarticulation shoulder disarticulation disarticulation no 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 please your mistake you are not exactly going through ankle you are cutting through the malleoli this is around 0.6 cm above ankle so so it's not exactly you know cutting through the ankle you're going a little above the ankle you know and you're actually cutting through the malleoli because malleoli you know malleoli would project below the ankle so so you're little above the malleoli so you have cut the malleoli so you have cut bone so that's why it's strictly not a disarticulation and that's why we use this word amputation for signs signs is an amputation that gives you an end bearing stump end bearing means weight bearing so this is an amputation over which someone can straight away bear weight now although an amputation the idea is bone preservation that you would do these amputations preserve more of bone rather than going through ankle but many surgeons negate other amputations they straight away go with signs at times explaining to the patient these advantages like end bearing stump so please be very clear with that this amputation okay mm, lot of questions lot of questions that trouble you from this area all right now let me see if anyone can crack this one a patient sustained a montikya fracture what will be the most specific sign that can guide you here regarding the norinchal ape thumb wrist drop or lack of extension of the metacarpophalangeal joints in the hand or lack of adduction abduction of the fingers yes so two part question the first part you have to be clear 
that when you know talking of meturia fracture which is the nerve that is getting injured and once you know which is the nerve that is getting injured next you have to pick up the, the clinical sign you will find that nerve injury navneet says t adnan says t ali says d so i think there is a chain that started to confuse the teacher people are saying ki we will all say d hum sabhi d bol denge to sir bhi dar jayenge please no if you are thinking in that manner then let me tell you orthopedic surgeons smarter than they look smarter than they look and need you are absolutely right at least in one thing the nerve that is going to be injured is p i n posterior interosseous nerve so absolutely right. this is a case of posterior interosseous nerve injury so full marks to full marks to so you told this is p i n injury so i will help you out solving this one uh but the p who you are saying a thumb in p i n injury please i don't get it see please there are three important nerves in the upper limb median nerve ulnar nerve because you know you have to be very familiar with these nerve injuries and the third one you very well know the radial nerve so these are the three major nerves of the upper limb now you need to know about the clinical signs of each nerve injury on a spinal level okay which nerve is called liberals nerve yes please help me out with this which nerve is called liberals nerve please tell me which nerve is called liberals nerve so which nerve you know as the liberals nerve out of the three i'm sure suno ka tum ne liberals nerve kis nerve ko liberals nerve kehte hain yes median absolutely right and i think you also know about the ulnar nerve this is a nerve that's popular by this name musician's nerve no please why is ulnar nerve called musician's nerve or or just imagine what is the job of a musician a musician has to play a piano if you want to play a piano what do you need with your fingers adduction and abduction i know you have heard of these muscles called interosseae there are palmar interosseae that adduct the fingers there are dorsal interosseae that abduct the fingers so this adduction abduction of the digits is what comes from the interosseae and these interosseae are what gets supplied by the ulnar nerve so it's ulnar nerve that is supplying the interosseae so it's ulnar nerve paralysis that's going to give you loss of adduction abduction of the fingers because ulnar nerve is called musician's nerve because it takes care of this adduction abduction of the fingers so this is going to come from ulnar nerve clear with that and it's not just the interosseae that gets supplied by ulnar nerve ulnar nerve also supplies the lumbricals at least the medial two lumbricals and the paralysis of these lumbricals in ulnar nerve palsy generates that medial sided claw hand so if ulnar nerve is there in your mind these are the two stat things that should come to your mind claw hand and that loss of adduction abduction of the fingers clear and adduction and abduction of the fingers come from ulnar nerve that is why it is musician's nerve clear now liberals nerve is median nerve and why is median nerve liberals nerve what is the job of a liberal a liberal has to hold a hammer and then he has to hammer now he has to hold a hammer so he needs flexion in the fingers and flexion in the thumb so he needs this thumb to flex and fingers to flex so thumb movements finger flexion they have to come from median nerve median nerve liberals nerve gone the finger flexion gone and this is what keeps the finger pointing 
that's where you get that pointing sign to ask the person to flex the fingers he can only flex the medial two fingers these three fingers cannot flex thumb cannot flex fingers can flex thumb cannot flex you can't hold so this pointing sign is what you get in medium or palsy because it's laborious now had these fingers flexed you would not have got that pointing sign and medial nerve will gone thumb movements will be gone eighth thumb is what you are going to get in medial nerve palsy your thumb will stay adducted like an egg you cannot abduct and oppose and flex and move the thumb because if you can move the thumb and do the laborer's job a laborer can never do the job without the thumb the most important thing to a laborer thumb so when you talk of laborer's now think about thumb movement think about finger movements thumb movement gone eight thumb finger movements gone the pointing sign so remember on a spinal level so clear with that so eight thumb will be something in medial nerve palsy and 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 that loss of adduction of finger that claw hand will be something in ulnar nerve palsy so are you guys clear with these things at least on a spinal level because this is just like that you know a uh, reflex thing now medial nerve ki baat aayegi to laborer ke bare mein sochna hai फिंगर की फ्लेक्शन जाएगी तो लेबर का काम जाएगा थंब की मूवमेंट जाएगी तो लेबर का काम जाएगा थंब की मूवमेंट गई थंब डक्ट होकर रह गया एक थंब फिंगर की फ्लेक्शन गई फिंगर्स पॉइंटिंग रह गई पॉइंटिंग इंडेक्स और अंदर ना म्यूजिशियंस ना एडक्शन एडक्शन गई म्यूजिक नहीं प्ले हो सकता क्लॉ एंड हो गया म्यूजिक नहीं प्ले हो सकता क्योंकि लंबराइकल्स और इंट्रोश गए सो क्लियर विद दैट क्लियर विद दैट सो दैट मीन्स दैट द नर्व दैट इज गॉन ओवर हेयर इज रेडियल नर्व और इट्स congenital pa and posterior interosseous branch but how do these signs help you to decide whether it is a case of radial nerve injury or pa and injury for this i will quickly take you through the anatomy of this very important nerve radial nerve which simply tends to be a continuation of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus it's a continuation of this posterior cord so up in the axilla you will find this nerve line posteriorly in fact you find it on the posterior side of the humerus only running in that very popular area that you guys know as that spiral groove correct now this is the nerve running in the spiral groove now when this nerve reaches the lower third of the humerus this is where this nerve wraps around the humerus to come in front and then this nerve travels in the front because at the elbow it has to cross lying in front of the lateral epicondyle so right here this nerve is lying basically in front of that lateral epicondyle i think even from your knowledge of anatomy you know medial epicondyle ke piche ulnar nerve hoti hai You have all that had that injury when something hits over here and paralyses go down your little fingers. So middle epicondyle के पीछे अंदर ना होती है और lateral epicondyle के आगे radial ना होती है. Now as this nerve will enter into the forearm, so right in the proximal forearm radial nerve will finish. So there is no radial nerve in the forearm. The radial nerve is only there in the arm. Now right in the proximal forearm this nerve divides. a superficial sensory branch goes to dorsum of hand for the sensory supply a deep branch pierces a muscle over here that is called supinator and now this deep branch goes on the posterior side of the forearm and this deep branch is what we call as posterior interosseous nerve pan is the only nerve on back of the forearm any damn thing on back of the forearm has to come from posterior interosseous nerve clear with that Now, in case you guys are a little bit clear with this course of radial nerve, let me just tell you: when this nerve is at the elbow, this is where it supplies a muscle called extensor carpi radialis longus. The word carpi would mean wrist. So, th- at the elbow, it is radial nerve. that is supplying the wrist extensor and when the extensor of the wrist is coming from the radial nerve at the elbow what is this nerve going to do pan this is rather going to supply 
the singer extensors so radial nerve will supply wrist extensors the pan branch in the forearm will supply finger extensors so radial nerve gone wrist extension gone wrist drop the pan branch gone finger extension gone finger drop और रिस्ट एक्सटेंशन तो पीएन इंजरी में इंटैक्ट रहेगी पीएन इंजरी में रिस्ट एक्सटेंशन तो इंटैक्ट रहेगी क्योंकि रिस्ट एक्सटेंशन तो रेडियल नर्व ने खुद ही सप्लाई कर दी थी स्पायरल ग्रुप को क्रॉस करते ही सो गाइस गाइस रेडियल नर्व इंजरी विल गिव यू रिस्ट ड्रॉप पीएन इंजरी विल गिव यू फिंगर ड्रॉप नो दिस इज अ केस ऑफ पीएन इंजरी मोंटेजिया फ्रैक्चर so this is what you want to find lack of tension at the mcp joints metacarpophalangeal joints so these knuckles will drop finger drop that is what is finger drop lack of extension at mcp joints so this is what i was mentioning as that finger drop so are you guys clear with the answer here and are you guys clear on a spinal level which nerve injury will have those signs those diagnostic signs So you talk of median nerve injury, talk of finger flexion gone, pointing index, talk of thumb flexion and thumb movement gone, eight thumb. You talk of ulnar nerve, adduction, adduction, musician's job difficult, claw hand. You talk of radial nerve, wrist drop. You talk of the PAN branch, finger drop. Clear? Perfect enough, perfect enough, perfect enough, perfect enough. And and anyone who can help me out with this one. Axillary crutch paralyzes which nerve? Axillary crutch paralyzes which nerve? Axillary crutch paralyzes which nerve? Uh, axillary crutch paralyzes which nerve? Come on, so easy, so easy. C, C. Neha says radial nerve. Yes, you are absolutely right, Neha. The answer is radial nerve. C. Crutch is something that you keep in the axilla. क्रच को एक्जिला में रखते हैं और अगर इस डायग्राम को देखोगे दी नर्व लाइन राइट इन दी एक्जिला पॉस्टीरियरली इज दिस रेडियल नर्व सो दिस इज वेयर क्रच वुड पैरालाइज द रेडियल नर्व राइट इन दी एक्जिला रेडियल नर्व विल बी गॉन सो यू विल हैव दैट रिस्ट ड्रॉप गेटिंग इट सो इन क्रच पैरालिसिस यू विल यू विल फाइंड रिस्ट ड्रॉप इन मोंटेरिया फ्रैक्चर्स यू विल फाइंड फिंगर ड्रॉप्स This question was there in the previous AIMS paper. Axillary crutch paralyzes which now some people connected this axillary with this axillary. They took choice B and they were wrong. So I suppose you are clear even with these nerve injuries. So guys, these were some of the topics we discussed. We talked about the amputations also. I just forgot to write it here. Okay. So these were few of the topics you know we talked of, and even in this hand wrist injuries, I talked of the Bennett Rolando fractures. and here i talked of scaphoid fracture and here i talked of the wrist dislocations okay and perhaps in nerve injuries we talked of all the three nerves radial nerve medial nerve and ulnar nerve the telltale signs okay and i talked of the two amputations also that are important to you so these were the topics we discussed today so i am done with my discussion for today any queries from the area that was covered today these topics because they are all high yield topics they've all been part of the inci paper of late there have been questions from this particular zone you know a number of times in the inci paper so that was the whole idea of discussing these topics so any queries or comfortable with the discussion today so please let me know yes yes navneet ankit devya ali neha atnan क्षितिज राज आर यू वेज कंफर्टेबल विद द डिस्कशन टुडे क्लियर विद दीज टॉपिक्स एट लीस्ट इन अ क्रिस्टल क्लियर वे येस एंड एंड दैट नर्व इंजरी क्वेश्चन वॉज द मोस्ट टफर टफेस्ट वन यू नो बिकॉज यू वेज वॉज कैटेड अक्रॉस ऑल ऑप्शन विद दो नर्व इंजरी पार्ट सो आर यू वेज क्लियर विद दिस थैंक यू फॉर द लवली कमेंट्स अली सो आई होप यू वेज आर ऑल क्लियर विद दिस बट इफ दिस एनी कन्फ्यूजन यू वेज स्टिल हैव दिस इज आर टेलीग्राम ग्रुप विद विच यू कैन कनेक्ट T. dot me, Doctor Mukul, or so you can just stay in touch with me, and you can ask up a query later also. Fine. Uh, in case you wish to know more, learn more from me, then want to attend more classes, then you have to subscribe to an academy, and you can just use this code to get your five percent off. 
or through life uh, you want to be a bigger discount we do have some 25 percent offers going on just check up the website and you can you know heavily save on the price the offers are very much there on the website uh, and you join the website you can be part of those learners you know who, who, who were very successful scored heavily in the neat exam with the help of the uh, you know wonderful uh, team we have at an academy and uh, in case you know if you're not subscribing at least you know uh, take uh, advantage of this free classes on youtube the ipl premier league that's going on uh, the nict premier league i will say uh, you you have almost all subjects being covered up you know over a short period of zone and i am covering orthopedics today and tomorrow you can attend the session tomorrow also i'll discuss more of such areas and this is the wonderful thing we have with us to take you through all the areas uh, you're preparing for fmg the upcoming exam you can subscribe there's material for you are preparing for the upcoming next one even then you can subscribe and 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 uh, anything for me you can catch me on the telegram group uh, one small query is there boxes fracture no problem before i say that bye bye to you i'll answer what's a boxes fracture now if you're involved in the sport of boxing you will generally injure the fifth metacarpal neck so boxes fracture is a fracture that involves the neck of the fifth metacarpal so clear with that definition also now okay and up the the preferable x-ray view lateral view for lunate dislocation we, we discuss it so well that it's the lateral view that shows you the classical signs in uh, lunate dislocation that spilled a teacup sign or spilled coffee sign so lateral view is what we are going to prefer okay i'm ha i'm i'm happy shitij i was able to give you some new concepts uh, my pleasure but yes you discuss with me you interact with me new things always come out from a teacher it's actually the students who keep the teacher going by letting him know that they are awake so love to interact with you guys it was wonderful to interact with you uh, still once again any queries after the class you can connect to me you can attach yourself to this group t.me dr mukul ortho okay and you can ask your queries for today that's in it that's it so stay connected with me tomorrow also 10 o'clock one or more one more class 10 more topics right into your pocket the high levels so good night for today wish you all the best keep studying see you tomorrow bye bye